Hello, and welcome to Beyond the Diagnosis, a podcast that features stories of people with lived experiences as a patient or caregiver. I'm your host, Monica, a neuroscience graduate and current medical student in Canada. Today's story centers around a highly impactful neurological disease. According to Alzheimer's Disease International, there is an estimated 55 million people worldwide living with dementia. And this number is set to rise. But its true impact extends beyond just the person with dementia, but also to their family members and their caregivers. So with effects this profound, I believe it's our priority to discuss some of the unseen challenges and to also provide some resources to support dementia care partners. So I had the very memorable opportunity to hear from a dementia care partner herself, Miss Webster. Not only does she bring lived expertise, she's Also, a certified dementia care consultant and the founder and ambassador of the Dementia Education Program at McGill University. Welcome, Ms. Webster. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining me. I just remember back in Med 1, Med 2, when I first heard of your story, it was so impactful. It stuck to me, even though some years have passed now. So I'm very grateful that you're here to share your story and to share some insights about being a dementia care partner. So I thought for those who might not be familiar yet, could you please speak to what is dementia and how does that differ from Alzheimer's disease? Dementia is really an umbrella term, similar to cancer being an umbrella term. It's really a complex condition that affects cognitive functions, including memory, communication, decision-making, as well as our activities of daily living. And there are different types of diseases that cause dementia. The most common ones are called Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, among others. So with so many intricacies that could be involved, I wonder whether you could also speak to some of the experiences that you have been through as a dementia care partner. Well, a lot of people think that dementia equals memory loss. And while, in fact, it does impact the memory, um, it, it has, there are very, there's a whole bunch of different symptoms that present. So, for example, uh, so persistent mem- memory loss, so memory loss that will impact uh, daily life, um, constantly forgetting people's names, constantly forgetting what time it is, appointments, that type of thing. Challenges with problem solving, so like specifically with regards to following instructions, following recipes, paying bills, um, lots of confusion with time and place. So, you know, thinking that it's nighttime when it's 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 still only the afternoon or waking up at two o'clock in the morning, thinking it's time to start the day, forgetting the days of the week. Um, It really impacts a person's language and communication. So as the disease progresses, people start to forget words, you know, commonly used words. Um, In my case, for example, my mother was Finnish and she would start mixing up Finnish and English in the same sentence. So and as it progresses more and more, they really have a hard time uh, putting together uh, sentences. Lack of judgment. Um, you know, we're, 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 today we're exposed with all kinds of uh, fraudulent emails and phone calls and even mm-hmm. healthy people sometimes have a hard time differentiating. But it's, it's really the loss of judgment, a loss of judgment with regards to even sometimes getting dressed. So if it's in the summertime, people may be dressing like it's in the wintertime. Um, and then when I mentioned earlier, it could also cause a significant change in a person's personality and moods. Um, you know, somebody that might have been very mild mannered uh, becomes extremely aggressive. Um, you know, it has an impact on on how people could react verbally using words that they would have never used before, uh, f- becoming physically aggressive at times. Um, and then just difficulty completing like everyday tasks, be- what we call our activities of daily living. So being able to get dressed, being able to just prepare a regular meal, as I mentioned earlier, doing your banking, grooming. And and then finally, it also, because of all of these different factors, it often causes people uh, to become more socially isolated. They become overwhelmed, like everything makes them feel overwhelmed. Conversations make them feel overwhelmed. So they become socially isolated. 
And what's challenging it with, with, with the symptoms is that there, there are too many public awareness campaigns out there right now, um, if we look on a global scale, uh, about dementia. And so um, it, it could often be confused as somebody being depressed. It could often can be confused as somebody being uh, taking drugs, uh, being drunk, um, under the influence of uh, different things. But um, because there are so many little symptoms that present that people really don't know, uh, you know, what, what's going on with the person. Because you mentioned things like personality changes, and things like memory loss. How does this present kind of temporally in terms of progression? Okay, so, so really, the beginning, it really affects a person, person's cognitive skills. So that exactly, at the beginning, it'll be everything to do with, you'll see changes in their personality, changes in their mood, slight changes in their memory. So from outward appearances, they look fine. And that's what's hard uh, for family members or for colleagues or friends. I remember with my mom, I, one of her friends would say to me, your mother, she looks fine. There's nothing wrong with her because outwardly she still looked very, very good. However, the way the disease progresses is that over time, it really starts to impact the activities of daily living. So at the beginning, again, it's very cognitive. They may be repeating themselves over and over again, but they're still able to get up and get dressed. And some of them can, people can still drive cook, etc. But as time goes on, all of those tasks start to become uh, affected. So then you start people start noticing slowly that hmm, they're not taking their shower every day. Uh, they're not maybe putting on the makeup, they're wearing the same clothes all the time. They're, they're, they're not preparing their meals. Um, they're, they're having difficulty uh, managing their bills. Uh, they're forgetting to pay bills. Their handwriting might start to change. And as, as the disease progresses more and more, you really start seeing the toll it takes on a person physically. So dementia itself is a terminal illness. Um, you know, there are people who may have pre-existing health conditions. So you could have a person that has dementia, but also has cancer, heart disease, diabetes, for which they may, you know, pass away from one of those illnesses prior to dementia. But if a person doesn't have any pre-existing health conditions, dementia itself is a terminal illness. So as on as the the disease evolves, it really has an impact on on the on the person physically and essentially by the end the body starts just really starts to begin to shut down where they have more and more difficulty swallowing uh, it impacts their mobility and so at the end everything just begins to shut down it feels very it feels very sad to hear and i wonder if you could also speak to your experience about like the whole emotional aspect of it throughout the progression the impact, the impact on the on on the care partner is really one of what we call anticipatory loss, right? So, you know, when you receive this type of diagnosis, it's like any other, you know, difficult diagnosis where you know, unfortunately, life becomes interrupted, right? It's a shock, and so for the care partner, you're you're constantly in a state of grieving because at the beginning. There, with all the changes that are taking place with your family members' communication, I see especially with regards to couples, for example, where you know you're sitting down having a meal, you're able to have these conversations and communicate. That starts to disappear. So you're you're starting to to mourn the loss of these communication skills and the conversations. But then as time goes on, what's so hard is you're witnessing these physical changes. And when I say physical ch changes, the person is really becoming more and more frail. Right? You start noticing. How how they're not, you know, you have to be careful how they walk. You want to reduce the risk of falls. You want to reduce the risk of injury. And you're witnessing the decline. And, you know, when you when you were in my, my class at McGill, you know, I even show visuals of how my, the, my mother, the, her eyes, right, in, in terms of how she's how she's looking at you. Like, it's almost as if she's she's disappearing right in front of your eyes. Um, you know, there are other cases depending on the type of dementia where a person could become very verbally and physically uh, aggressive. And that becomes very hard because here, once upon a time, you had this loving relationship with a person and then they become so verbally aggressive towards you. So there are all kinds of emotions uh, that, that, that are, are brought upon the, the care partners as a result of this illness. But sadness, I have to say, is probably one of the most overriding emotions that we feel. It's it's the sadness to constantly witness this loss over, you know, a, a period of could be many years. The anticipatory emotions that you mentioned, I wonder whether this ties into the idea of early diagnosis and how perhaps that could help. 
Because I remember back in our lectures, you mentioned that it's quite difficult to get the person you're taking care of to access the healthcare service in the first place when you first notice some signs of dementia. Mm -hmm. So how do you initially advocate for a loved one who you suspect might have dementia with these challenges in mind? Okay, so that question will have multiple answers. So the first the first part is it is important to try to get a diagnosis as early as possible. Okay, that's that's important um, because now there are some new drugs that are coming out on the market, not available yet in Canada, but soon to be, that could could slow down the progression. There is no cure, but there are drugs that could potentially slow down the progression. So there is some hope, but but in order for these drugs to work, they you have to be diagnosed in the early stages. The challenge is, as I mentioned earlier, there is no public awareness campaign and the majority of people do not recognize the signs and symptoms. So most of the time, by the, by the time you brought your family member to see a doctor, the disease has already advanced quite mm -hmm. a bit. But by, by having a diagnosis, it, it provides the family with a bit of a sense of relief in, in, in terms of saying, okay, there is, there is in fact something wrong. Okay. Because uh, prior to the diagnosis, you're really wondering like what's going on, why are they behaving this way? So by naming it, okay, it does provide some, a sense of maybe, I mean, relief is a difficult word to say, but at least here's the, here's the, here's the situation. And now how do we move forward? Right. Also a diagnosis is extremely important because as the disease progresses, it may bring on some responsive behaviors where medications would be needed. So for example, if the person starts to become depressed or starts to become aggressive, uh, anxious, there are medications that could manage all of that. And again, as the disease evolves and the person is no longer able to manage their finances or drive, they the family really needs to have a doctor sign off on a letter stating that the person is becoming incapacitated. You need that for financial legal issues. The other challenge, however, is, is the fact that the disease um, brings forth another illness called anosognosia. And anosognosia means that the person that is suffering these symptoms has a total loss of insight. They are not aware at all that anything is wrong. So the family members, friends, neighbors are seeing the changes, but the person themselves doesn't recognize that there's anything wrong. And that makes it hard because like in my case, I wanted to take my mom to see the doctor when she didn't believe she needed to see a doctor because she didn't think anything was wrong. So that's always a very difficult step. Um, you know, I, I always suggest to families to use what I call a compassionate lie, where you tell your loved one, we are both going for an annual physical checkup to see the doctor. We are both going to for a flu shot, but we have to see the doctor first for a checkup, right? So you've got to try to use a little bit of tricks. But with this illness, um, the, 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 the pathway to getting a diagnosis isn't always so clear because in some cases, there are family doctors who have the necessary training to be able to do a proper assessment in their office. So the, so the families will leave with an assessment. Then there are the family doctors who are unfortunately may have not received the education and training that they needed to do the assessment. So what happens then is that the family has to be referred to either a geriatrician or a neurologist. And so it's the, 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 the journey of getting that diagnosis could be complex. It's not just seeing one person and then knowing what's up. And there are a few tests that also have to be performed in order to get that proper assessment. And finally, I have to say that what with a doctor with probably the information that is most important to the doctor is the is what the family members are going to share the signs and symptoms that were witness that the family members witness right so in addition to doing some perhaps scans and blood tests the the, the doctor really needs the family members to arrive and, and I would suggest before, send this list before the appointment, okay? Because it's very hard to talk about a person in front of the person when they have anosognosia. Um, but really the, what, what, what the family members can share is, is really, really key to doing an assessment. I see. So kind of just to summarize, it's from what I understand, quite variable depending on the experience of the practitioner themselves. Mm -hmm. For example, a GP who is equipped to make the necessary investigations for dementia versus someone who is not, which would lead to a referral. And then from there, you would still need to help the loved one get the care that they that they need. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and to do a proper assessment, I mean, it takes about a good hour, hour and a half. And if you think about family doctors, I mean, 
you know, the reality is they're supposed to see, you know, six patients every hour. So that's 10 minutes per patient. So it's very hard for a family doctor to be able to conduct a true proper assessment, like cognitive testing and all everything that they need, you know, in, in, a, in a 10 minute time. But that's the healthcare system. That's where it's going. They want the family doctors to be able to do more assessments. But considering how many patients and the amount of time, I don't know how that that's possible to get mm -hmm. a true proper assessment. So it really sounds like it's complex to make the diagnosis. And so a follow-up question that I have regarding one point that you mentioned, anosognosia, yeah. um, the lack of awareness, how does then receiving the diagnosis impact the patient and also the care partner, given that they might not even be aware that they could have dementia? Yeah, that, that could become very challenging. And um, I was just I was just at a conversation with Alzheimer's Society of Canada about this before I'm talking to you. But, you know, first of all, before making any type of um, diagnosis, the doctor has to be sure that there will not there's no potential for what we call a catastrophic reaction on the patient's behalf. Right. So you don't want you want to make sure that the patient is able to receive this type of diagnosis. And that doesn't happen after just one. It should not happen after one appointment. Um, myself, I had one appointment and my, my the neurologist announced to my mother that she had Alzheimer's disease and she became furious and she wasn't she wasn't able to accept it. Okay? She, I have to be honest. So that's why it's very important that when um, you are going, when there is a doctor's appointment, that the person be accompanied by a family member. You should the, the person who is being assessed should not be on their own because Yes, there are some people that are aware that there are changes happening and that they're aware of, you know, of, of, of what's happening. And there's a big stigma around the word Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Um, but it, it's, it's very advisable that um, you always be accompanied with a family member because it, it could come as a shock, as, as could the disclosure of any other, you know, difficult disease like, like cardiovascular illness or cancer, right? So, uh, people react differently and it really depends on their level of awareness and what is going on uh, with them. I'm wondering as well, how often do you, and if you interact with other healthcare professionals, for example, like a social worker to support the kind of after effects of receiving the diagnosis or someone like a psychologist, geriatrician, you name it. In, in the perfect world, it takes a multidisciplinary team to surround the patient, right? And so what happens, for example, in Quebec, is if a person is diagnosed with any form of uh, any form of dementia, uh, depending where they are, like in what stage they're at, families are often uh, recommended to be in touch with a CLSC social worker. So the social worker is really the one that would come and that would assess the living situation at home and, you know, maybe recommend some home care support if needed. And then again, in Quebec, if they need to transition to long-term care to the public system, it needs to be done by a social worker. You know, in some cases, the family doctor is able to manage the case as a whole. Otherwise, it will be the, the case will be sent to, to a geriatrician, right? Um, and and oftentimes, a person will see a geriatrician if they have other pre-existing health conditions. So you may have an older adult who has, you know, heart issues and diabetes and high blood pressure. So it's 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 it's, it's if they can also be managed by a ger geriatrician who specializes in dementia. That's that's ideal, right? If it's required that the person have, they want to do some more investigation and have more scans and have more precise uh, details on what type of dementia, then they would probably be seen by a neurologist. And then, you know, because the disease affects a person's, again, activities of daily living along the way, ideally, you would have an occupational and physical therapist that's involved that comes and does a home assessment and ensures that the person is safe uh, at home. Um, you know, you may have a nutritionist that could be involved, uh, definitely a psychologist. But I, like in my case, I had a psychologist for myself lending me support. But it's, you know, it, as we see, it's harder and harder in our current healthcare system to access all of these resources. The majority of people also don't have the, the finances. It's a very expensive disease to manage financially um, because the more the disease evolves, the more care that you need. So oftentimes, if you want to have access to different resources, because of the waiting list in the public system, people may have to go privately. And that that's something that's not always attainable mm -hmm. for many people.
Due to the barriers to accessing care, I can imagine that as the onus on the caregiver, the care partner as well, is quite high. And this could perhaps look like creating like a safe environment for the person living with dementia, um, offering emotional support. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to some of the strategies that you use to or that you offer for other people to create a safe and supportive environment for um, living at home. Well, that, exactly. I mean, for me, what's most important whenever I hear that a person is still living at home and whether, you know, especially if in their, they're in the early to mid stages, it's it's kind of like I said, that gray zone where you always say, are they safe? And, you know, there are certain areas of a home that could cause more uh, danger than others. So, for example, um, you know, the bathroom, it should you should always have the bath mats outside of the shower. You really want to avoid any types of slips and falls. You may want to have a handlebar in the shower. Um, be aware of not keeping medications lying around because as the disease progresses, the person really needs to be administered their medication because if they take it on their own, they could forget to take their medications or they double up. So medications like that are in medicine cabinets or lying around on kitchen tables or bedside tables should be removed, right? And you know, I really look at everything because it, it's an illness that affects our vision. So the peripheral vision starts to narrow and it really affects the mobility. The person starts to develop a bit of a shuffle. You have to imagine that if a person wakes up in the middle of the night, is there any risk of them falling? So are the hallways well lit? Is there a nightlight in the bathroom? Um, are there any cords that they could potentially fall over or lifted carpets, you know, loose carpets around? I also, I'm always concerned about stairs because it does affect the visual spatial. So somebody's ability to easily understand how to go up and down stairs. Whenever I do home assessments, I look, are the stairs, are there runners on the stairs? How steep are the stairs? Because what happens is as time progresses, if if a person wants to remain at home for as long as possible and their mobility is affected, I often recommend that they move their bedroom onto the main floor. Um, because if if they like if they suffer a fall or any type of physical injury, it will make the disease progress much faster. And using my mother as an example, you know, she had to have hip replacement surgery, and unfortunately, it did not go well. Uh, she was also not able to be rehabilitated because she didn't understand the instructions on you know the exercises to do. Uh, and so she ended up you know being once upon a time a very physically fit woman but then had to use a walker. Then she forgot how to use the walker. She started falling and then I had to transfer to a, to a wheelchair. But, you know, safety, you know, there's also issues where sometimes, a, you know, a spouse will say, well, I've just gone out for a couple of hours and, and I've left them, they're okay alone. But are you sure they're okay alone? Are you sure they don't go into the kitchen and, you know, forget and turn on the stove and forget the stove is turned on? You know, um, you know, a microwave could also be dangerous where they're putting something into the microwave for too long or that they shouldn't go into the microwave. So there are all kinds of, of areas in the home that could cause, you know, injury and fall uh, if not properly supervised. Like with many considerations, like I feel like there's so many subtle things, whether it's like the bath mats or like the microwaves. I can imagine that as the disease progresses, there could be a point where it's no longer safe to be at home, especially if the caregiver has other responsibilities. How would you approach the conversation about assisted living if that's something that comes up? Well, I think what what caregivers have a hard time in in realizing is really assessing our own abilities, right? And and look, nobody wants to move to a residence or, you know, we we try to encourage people to try, try to have home care support at the beginning. And but at some point it it becomes not only it's no longer safe for the person with living with dementia, but it becomes no longer safe for the care partner. And with this type of illness, a lot of the care partners are over the age of 75. Some are in their mid eighties. They themselves may have some physical limitations. And because the disease progresses where the care partner has to help them, you know, go to the washroom, get into the shower, do the transfers, you know, they start to become incontinent, um, you know, they have trouble eating, uh, they get up multiple times in the evening, perhaps wandering, you know, for, for a care partner, if you're on the verge of complete burnout and exhaustion or anger, right, there's a lot of them that become extremely angry, 
you just can't. I mean, you, I, 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 I see these families all the time, especially it's very hard for spouses. You know, you've had this, you know, for better or for worse marriage. And, you know, then you have to wake up and realize I just it's I just can't take care of my husband or my wife anymore. And it's a devastating decision to have to make. But at the same time, it's an important one because, you know, you think that you're doing your best to care for your loved one at home, but it gets to the point where you may not be able to. The disease could present, as I mentioned earlier, where the person could become very verbally or physically abusive towards their spouse. They could become very, very dangerous where they it, it, they just can't be home, you know? And so I, the, the care partners end up feeling tremendous amount of guilt, but they shouldn't because, you know, you're, you're, as the disease progresses, the, this it becomes harder on the care partner than it is on the person because the person is is losing their insight more and more. We start as care partners witnessing all those physical uh, changes that have take place. And so the number one priority as a care partner has to be the person's safety, their cleanliness, you know, and their happiness for, for what happiness is worth. And, you know, I, there are times where people think, oh, uh, I'm, my, my husband, my wife, mother, father is never going to residence. But by moving them to a residence, I have a recent case where the, the husband was just moved to a residence. He's actually doing better because he's getting a lot of social stimulation. While he was at home, he was just in, in the living room, just in front of the television, which he couldn't even really understand anymore. But by being in a, in, a, in a good residence, he's socially stimulated because he's surrounded by activity all day long. I can imagine that with all these challenges, it's hard for the caregiver themselves to look after themselves. So I'm just wondering, as you speak about that, how do you, as a caregiver, take care of yourself? Well, the majority of people that I meet were like myself, you know, I suffered a very, very severe burnout. Um, and it wasn't just from being a care partner, because the truth is, you know, anybody who's caring for somebody who's who's not well, you also have a life, right? You like I, I represented the sandwich generation where I had three young kids, and I had a job and I had society's expectations, right? And I believed I made the mistake of believing that I was superwoman or superhuman where, you know, I can just go and go and go. And unfortunately, a lot of a lot of care partners don't believe that they have permission to have a life. You know, I find that oftentimes with spouses where, you know, they say, well, because my husband can't do this anymore, well, then I can't. And they feel like, you know, the, the guilt is so overwhelming for them that they just they just don't give themselves any permission to have any time. So uh, sadly, it often takes a, a burnout or, or a close to burnout for a care partner to realize, okay, it's time for me. And what I say is, look, you even if you can just find like one hour a day to go for a walk, just a walk, I'm not telling you to go to a gym, I'm not telling you to just, just a walk, breathe, you know, get some fresh air. Um, I always say like set boundaries. So you know, I had to do when I in order to recover from my burnout, I really had to do a triage of my life and look at what was working and what was not working. And who were the people in my life that were adding positive vibes and those that weren't right. And I had to really, you know, dig deep and get rid of like, you know, some toxic friends, or sometimes it could be family members that are not positive. And so you know, you can't really get rid of family members, but you can make the decision to say, I'm not having dinner with these people, but I'm going to do lunch because lunch is short. It's an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. It normally doesn't involve alcohol. Hopefully it doesn't. And then that's it. But, you know, or, or you know, the, the friend that would get, get mad and say, well, why aren't you calling me? What You really have to give yourself permission to say, you know, like to really preserve your energy and not give your energy away to people or to commitments. You know, some as, as a society, I find we have a really hard time saying no. So people will ask us, oh, could you do this? Could you do that? The answer is no, right? And we don't have to apologize. So it's, it's you know, I would also suggest that if you're feeling, you're starting to feel overwhelmed, it's important to seek professional help. Like if you can see, get professional help from a, a social worker, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a group therapy, but don't wait um, until you're, you know, burning out to seek help. And I think probably the two most important things is that 
oftentimes, you know, anger, stress, burnout comes when you feel that you don't have control. So education is key. It's really important to become as educated as possible about the disease, whatever disease that you're dealing with, right? But become as educated as possible. Be one step ahead of it at all times. And also become educated as soon as possible about all the community resources that could help you and the person that has the illness, right? And don't wait. A lot of times we say, oh, I'm not there yet. Right. But don't wait till you're there and then you're crying for help. Right. You've got to do your research and become educated as early as possible. You speak to the importance of acting early to be educated, to be proactive and to have boundaries in order to care for yourself. And I wonder, just to conclude, whether you have any resources you'd like to share for people who are also dementia care partners. Well, I would love to share uh, the McGill University Dementia Education Program, which I proudly founded in 2017 um, as a result of my own journey of being a care partner and not being educated or supported by the healthcare system. And, um, you know, I, 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 I had no prior affiliation to McGill, but I, I knew that we had one of the best medical schools in the world in our city. And, you know, I approached them and said, you know, how would you like to create this community program with me? And, and the dean said yes. And so we've, we've really developed a comprehensive range of resources. They're all free. Um, you go to mcgill.ca slash dementia. I'll, I'm sure you'll share the link with, um, yes, with the listeners. And we have various um, uh, resources. So one of the most important ones that I would recommend is our Dementia Companion Guide. Um, it's available in 10 different languages. Um, and you can download it for free. Uh, if people want printed copies, it's about $20 on Amazon and it supports our program, but it's available in 10 different languages and many more to come because dementia doesn't discriminate. And it's important for us to really educate uh, a really multicultural population about this disease. And then we have a webcast series called McGill Cares, where I've uh, produced about 100 uh, webcasts with all kinds of leading healthcare professionals on various topics, not only related to dementia, but other um, topics like ALS, Parkinson's, even cancer. Uh, I have experts, I have uh, caregivers, I have survivors. So that's a really great uh, webcast series. And we're also, uh, I would also recommend that people go and read the 2021 and 2022 World Alzheimer Reports produced by Alzheimer's Disease International, which is on our website. The first one is on a journey through a diagnosis of dementia. And the other one is all about post-diagnostic management and care. And again, really it's a, it's experts from all around the world that have contributed to these, um, to these reports. And we have some support groups um, in partnership with Alzheimer's Society in Montreal. We've got virtual support groups. We have a young carers uh, support group. We also have an, a wonderful program called Caring Conversations with two pioneer social workers where every month there's a different topic they present and then caregivers could just register and you interact with the social workers, which is great. And we're currently developing um, um, activity modules, leisure and recreational modules to teach care partners all kinds of activities that they could do at home to stimulate um, a person living with dementia. And hopefully in 2024, we'll also be launching our online education program. So uh, they're all there for you and people to access for free. Thank you so much for all that you do. It's really amazing to share that your um, dementia companion guide has been translated to so many different languages. I love how you're making everything very accessible. So thank you very much, Ms. Webster, for your time and for sharing your expertise. Well, thank you for having me, Monica. Glad to be here. I'd also like to thank you, the listener, for tuning into one of the first episodes of the Beyond the Diagnosis podcast. If you have a story you'd like to share or some feedback you'd like to give, then please reach out to me directly at hi at gmail.com. See you in the next episode. <laughs>